I bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, our dear Lord, who suffered and died for us. It's a real privilege that God has given us to have another Lenten season for about 40 days where we can once again go through the suffering and the passions of the Lord Jesus Christ and more so during this particular week where we could go day by day walking through the paths, the Calvary Road that the Lord Jesus Christ took on your behalf and on my behalf. The theme that is chosen for this particular week is a daily cross. You must have seen it several times in the notice boards. Now the reason why I have chosen that theme when I was asked to speak and bring God's word during this week, I am thoroughly convinced that a new generation of preachers and even Christians has come, which is very strange and totally alienated from the message of the cross. Now, about which Apostle Paul in his time, especially when he wrote to the Philippian church, he said, many walk of whom I have often told with weeping, even now I repeat, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are not the enemies of Christ, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Which means, all the time, they talk about the physical blessings, the physical health and the physical wealth, the goodies of life, prosperity. You turn on to your TV, you read any average Christian periodical, whichever direction you turn and whichever country you go. That which is thrown in plenty for the public consumption is this stuff which is, without any apology I would like to say is another gospel. And that is another Jesus. And this was predicted by Apostle Paul even 2,000 and odd years ago. So I believe it is time that we as Christians, especially committed to the traditional faith of Christendom, that we restore the cross to back its place in our preaching, in our practice, in our thinking, in our commitment, in everything we do. We should not only be Christocentric, We also should be cross-centered. I would like you to turn with me to begin with, to open up our subject to Luke's Gospel, 9th chapter, if you've got your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, maybe you can have the Bibles of a neighbor shared. And I would very much urge you to look into your Bibles and see for yourselves whether things are so. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, I will read verses 22 and 23. Jesus Christ spoke to the disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. That's good. We all know this was what was prophesied and predicted by all the Old Testament prophets. There is no single prophet who did not point towards the Calvary. And Jesus Christ repeats it. Now that much is good. But if he had stopped there, it would have been perhaps palatable. But he went one step further. If you look at verse 23, then he said to them all. Now some of the modern translations may not have that word then in it. But the more conventional translations like King James Version and New King James Version, they still retain the conjunctions which give us a lot of clue for interpreting a biblical passage. Then he said to them all, that means having said that he must suffer and he must be rejected and then he must be killed and so on and so forth. Having said it, then he said to them all, first of all, what would happen to him? And next he says, what should happen to all the rest? Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, I have encircled the word all and anyone in my Bible. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. I again stretch that word daily. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Now the only difference between Christ bearing the cross and we Christians bearing the cross is this. 
Christ bore the cross, carried the cross and then he died. We die and then carry the cross all our life. Now this is the plan of God in his economy. Understand this very clearly. For Christ, it was carrying the cross once and then dying. For us, we first die with Christ and then we carry the cross all our life. In other words, the cross of Jesus Christ must affect all areas of our life. Nothing excluded. There is no area in our life, no aspect in our life, no part of our life that can be excluded from the deep inworking of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why when I was asked to give the titles for this uh, eight-day meditation, Sunday to Sunday, with six weekdays in between, I gave the subject for Palm Sunday, Daily Cross and Worship. That's why we Christians begin. And then for Monday, I had given the topic, Daily Cross and Word Study. And then for Tuesday, it is Daily Cross and Wealth. And for Wednesday, it is Daily Cross and Work. And for Monday, Thursday, I have given the topic, Daily Cross and Witness. And for Good Friday, it is Daily Cross and Worries. And for Saturday, it is Daily Cross and Worldliness. And for Easter Sunday, it will be again another Daily Cross plus, which I would tell on the Resurrection Day. Now, I have chosen these uh, topics in such a way that more or less they would fit into the events and happenings of this Holy Week. So much so, I would very much request you, dear brothers and sisters, to please go through the closing chapters of the, each of the four Gospels of the New Testament. And don't assume that you know it all, or you have read it so many times. Read them afresh. That's the miracle of the Bible. That's the miracle of God's word. Every time you read it, a new truth, a new revelation pops up. Because it is a word with life. Daily cross. This obviously is not a delightsome subject. Maybe I can say it is a very distasteful or even for some people detestable subject. But the way of Christ is the way of the cross. Or in the words of the great writer Roy Zion, the way of Christianity is the road of Calvary. Now if you would like to pick up one book which you would like to read during this season, go to ELS and get a copy of Roy Zion's Calvary Road. You won't be able to read it for long sitting on your chair. It will throw you on your knees. And before you finish that book, you would, I guarantee, experience a personal revival and renewal in your life. Now that book has come on an expanded edition, The New Calvary Road by Roy Hazayan. The crossless Christianity that we come across in abundance, both inside and outside the church corridors, is not the biblical Christianity. Daily cross and worship. The cross and worship are inseparable. Do you know where that word worship comes for the first time in the Holy Bible? Now there are references where we read about calling on the name of the Lord. But that word worship in its purest form occurs for the first time from the lips of patriarch Abraham. God told him to take his only beloved begotten son Isaac and take him to a mountain that he would show him and offer him to him. And Abraham without asking questions took his son and went on a three days journey to Mount Moriah. There leaving his servants behind this is what Abraham said. You stay here. The lad and I, we will go yonder, we will worship and come back. 
Now what do you understand from that? Abraham knew that he was going to offer his son as a sacrifice. But the word he uses to his servants for that act of sacrifice was worship. Worship is not strictly an English word. It is actually from an Anglo-Saxon word. From which we have another derivative, another equivalent, worship. So when you talk about worship, it is not what is offered, but to whom it is offered. So it was in the context of sacrifice, because we all know that Isaac was the perfect type of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning sacrifice. It was in that context we get that word worship introduced to us as biblical readers. Let's leave the other passages in the Old Testament and come quickly to the New Testament. There were some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem. Why had they come to Jerusalem? The Bible says, when you get back home, you can read John 12th chapter. They had come to Jerusalem to worship. And they said, having come to worship, Sir, we would see Jesus. Immediately the disciples, one to another, they passed on that word by mouth. And the news reached to Jesus that there were certain Greeks who were waiting to see him. Turn with me to get the context to John's Gospel, 12th chapter. It's so interesting and inspiring. A casual reader would miss that impact. 12th chapter of John's Gospel. In verse 20 we read, Now there were certain Greeks, they came to worship at the feast, and then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told that to Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And verse 23 says, My Bible has that conjunction, But, Jesus answered them saying, But, so he gives the twist. They wanted to see the Jesus, the teacher Jesus. That Jesus known for his wisdom, his knowledge. Because Greeks are always looking for sign and wisdom. So they wanted to see that Jesus. And they said they have come to worship God. But Jesus answered. Jesus answered and told them. That means in response to what these Greeks were about to have. As an interview with that master. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Worship and the cross. Worship and sacrifice. Now this particular verse was very much quoted during the time we all were terribly shattered by the Life burning of uh, Graham Staines and his two sons. You know, until then, you know, we used to go to a lot of villages in North India and you ask whether they knew about the gospel, whether they knew about Jesus. They would say very politely and honestly, he is not in this village, try in the next village. But after Graham Staines was born alive with his two sons, you go to any reasonably good village in North India, they know about conversion, they know about Christians, they know about the word missionary. And do you know in the land of Orissa now, the church growth is much faster than many other states in India? A state once which was just abandoned by traditional missionary organizations as impossible. Last month I was in Bihar. Bihar was once called to be the graveyard of missionaries. But today, they say it is the vineyard of missions. How come? I had the privilege of addressing 1,500 North Indian pastors in Patna for three days. I couldn't just believe such a thing I could imagine in Chennai or in Tenerife. 1,500 pastors coming together for a three-day of Bible study conference. But the first time I was literally thrilled Things are happening because the blood of martyrs is truly the seed of the church. 
We all have the most famous chorus, worship chorus, which we will be singing very much as we approach Easter, especially on Easter Sunday. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, He is Lord. But have you ever passed to notice the context of that verse? Turn with me to Philippians second chapter. We are talking about worship and giving you a few scripture passages which say that worship and the cross are inseparable. Philippians second chapter, reading from verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No full stop there. There's a comma. To the glory of God the Father. So where does the, how does this uh, worship begin? Where does it begin? Where does it stem? And where does it culminate? It is in the backdrop and background of the suffering and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, these days there is a renewal in worship everywhere. We need to be happy about And at the same time, if you very analytically look at the kind of stuff that goes in the name of worship, it makes one very sad if he knows the Bible. Because even the worship has become very man-centered and self-centered. What will I get out of that worship service? How was the worship service? Oh, it was very nice. We enjoyed it. Again, we enjoyed it. It was a great blessing to me. It gave me a nice feeling. That is why most of our worship is becoming more of a performance than a sacrifice. Worship in the strictest sense, beloved, I have deliberately chosen these words this evening. It has become a performance rather than a sacrifice. Because it has become more of a performance than it is the concept of sacrifice. The reverential fear that our forefathers used to talk about in worship is very sadly and badly missing. The reverential fear, that awesomeness, the trembling with fear, rejoicing with trembling in the presence of God, that is missing. To the extent your modern teaching connected with prayer and worship goes. You can command God in prayer and God will answer you. What nonsense. There is an Old Testament text which says, Command ye me. That is not a statement, it's a question. How can you command me? You are a clay, I am the potter. Can you question me? The Bible says in Hebrews 5th chapter, Turn with me. These are all key texts which I would very much urge you to just review when you get back home. And just try to put these things together. The Holy Spirit will enable you to just put these things together and make your understanding better and enlightened. Look at Hebrews 5th chapter, verses 7 and 8. Jesus in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehem and cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death. And was heard because of his godly fear. Underline that. Why was Jesus heard? Because of his godly fear. Because of his godly reverence. Because of his reverential fear. No, no, no. God is our father. So we don't need to have that kind of a reverential fear when we approach him as if he is a tyrant and he is a monarch. No. That's what people are taught today. But what does the Bible say? Look at the eighth words. Though he was a son. The right translation will be, though he was the son. 
God has many sons, but he has only one son. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So brothers and sisters, there you know, lots of young people are sitting here. I'm so excited to see you filling up these front rows. And many of you are at the beginning of your Christian life. Never ever. Because you are getting used to the spiritual things. And you get more and more acquainted with religious meetings. Lose that godly reverence. Or keeping the cross as the center of your worship. We sometimes have the audacity to think that prayer is meant to change God. No, prayer is to change us to fit into God's plan. Some of you must have come across this beautiful prayer. This is a testimony, I will read it out for you. The testimony of an answered prayer. I asked for strength. But God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom. But God, God gave me problems. To learn to solve them. I asked for prosperity. But God gave me brain and brawn to work. I asked for courage. But God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked for love. But God gave me troubled and difficult people to live with. I asked for favors. But God gave me opportunities. And the person with his such wonderful rich experience... In the school of prayer, Jens is saying, I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything I needed. Shall I say that again? I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything I needed. And my prayer has been answered. In the words of John the Baptist, whom Jesus Christ would call as the greatest of prophets born among women. No one like John the Baptist. If you want me to borrow his phraseology to define worship, in worship, I must decrease so he might increase I might decrease so he might increase I want the Lord to shine but I cannot just remain without burning it is told of John the Baptist he was a burning and shining light we want to shine without burning it is in burning you decrease like a candle shine O oh Lord shine we sing but are we ready to pay the price of burning ourselves? Cross and worship. Daily cross and worship. The cross of Christ also teaches us the other side of worship. That's very interesting. I always try to look at the other side of any truth in the Bible. Because I believe truth is always parallel. No bird can fly with one wing. No train can run on one rail. And God speaks to us through two lips, which are the two testaments. Everything, uh, when you come to the spiritual truth, is parallel. You have to keep one truth and the other truth and keep them in proper tension and bring it to symmetry. Only then the right understanding is there. So whenever I study the Bible and any particular spiritual discipline, I always try to look at the other side. Now that keeps me balanced. Now we talk about worship. Now what is the other side of worship that the cross of Jesus Christ teaches? Turn with me to begin with Ephesians. I'll give you two or three. 
of the other side aspects with the limited time that is before us Ephesians 5 5th chapter and look at the second words walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma fragrance but you know in which context this particular Christ offering himself as a sweet smelling aroma look at verses 31 and 32 of the previous chapter now don't read stop your Bible by where the chapter stops you know the chapter and verses and all were not originally inspired they were only added a little later for convenience sake so you just read through it's a full letter you stop with any particular chapter ending then you miss the truth whole truth so look at verses 31 and 32 let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all my lies and be kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another just as God in Christ also forgave you therefore be followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ himself offered himself as a sweet selling aroma to God see so the other side of worship is our interpersonal relationship there also later on you can refer to it we talk about he was obedient to the death even to the death on the cross in Philippians we read that and if you go a few verses before that he talks about let this mind be in you which was all in Christ Jesus what mind don't look, just look for yourselves and your own needs your own desires look in the interest of others also and then he says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus I was very happy when the leader of this um, evening service she made a statement welcome to the worship of this community I like that verse instead of using that very traditional word congregation this looks this word is better community that is a, a group of people living in unity not necessarily to talk the same thing and think the same thing and not having two opinions no unity is not uniformity but unity means this unity is a matter of the spirit and the heart praise God for CMC I have been associated with this institution now from 1971 praise God for this institution but we know that this community is divided superficially outwardly we can just gloss over but when you get into the heart of the matter when you go deep into the situation we know that we are divided on so on so many ways and we are bringing more dishonor than honor to the name of the Lord I think this holy week let it be a time for us to reconcile with one another and maintain a good interpersonal relationship so beautifully they enacted the neem tree the bitter tree they brought the two sticks and one vertical and the other horizontal the vertical staff of the cross speaks about man getting reconciled with God and the horizontal staff speaks about man reconciling with man that's why this is called the message of reconciliation the cross it is easy for us to worship God love God with all your heart with all your mind with all your spirit with all your strength and so on and so forth that man asked only what is the greatest of all commandments Jesus gave the first commandment and then he said the second commandment which is equivalent to the first commandment he did not ask for the second commandment but for Jesus without telling the second commandment the first commandment is not complete love your neighbor as yourself because it is second commandment it is not a secondary commandment I think brothers and sisters that is why the Lord Jesus Christ said when you come to the altar why do you come to the altar to worship God when you come to the altar there if you remember that your brother has got something against you not if you have got something against your brother Jesus always goes one step further she was talking about second mile second court Christianity is a different religion it is altogether the highest form no comparison it is not if you have something against another person no if you remember that if your brother has got something against you don't offer the gift 
leave the gift at the altar, first go and get reconciled, then come and offer the gift. Worship. The other side of worship. And in book of Hebrews, 13th chapter, Hebrews 13th chapter, 12th verse. Here again, you know, we are very serious when we come up to the 12th chapter of Hebrews because that is the main doctrinal body of it. But 13th chapter we miss out, but it has got many, many practical lessons. Hebrews 13. Look at the 12th word. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Having said it, in verse 15 we read, Therefore, you know, therefore, because Jesus suffered like that outside the gate, therefore, by him, let us continuously offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us continuously worship him. Cross and worship. Does he stop there? The very next verse. But, do not forget to do good and to share. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Do not forget. When you are get caught in that rapturous worship, praising God, adoring God, do not forget to share and to do good because with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. I think here is a commentary on what the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest, he forgot because he was busy with the service. He had to go to the temple to conduct the service. So he bypassed that wounded man. The Levite, he must go in a hurry to count the coins which, would have, which will come a tithe to that priest. He also bypassed. They were very busy with the religious rites and duties, but they forgot to take care of this wounded man. That's why here the Bible says, the writer of the Hebrews, we don't know who the, which the writer was, but the unknown writer of the Hebrews says, forget not. When you are offering up praises unto God, forget not. Remember the other side also. We had that passage read out to us. Will you please turn to the passage that was read out to us for the scripture lesson? Something very interesting. The scenario of that uh, first Palm Sunday. It is Matthew. Chapter 21. Look at verse 13. Jesus, you know, whipped these people and he said, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This is one side of worship. Look at the 14th verse, the very next verse. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. He is now doing good. Then, the other side of worship. So how beautiful. This is why I fell in love with the Bible before I fell in love with my wife. And I continue to be falling in love with the Bible again and again. It's just inexhaustible. I'm so excited. That is why I speak with excitement. I'm excited with the Bible. It has never grown dry for me. I want you dear young people to be excited with the Bible and read the Bible. So during this week, take time. Maybe after all your laboratories and clinics and classes and everything will be over. Take time. Withdraw yourself somewhere. And read through all the four Gospels, the last few chapters. You'll never be the same again. The same Bible, the same translation. You read it again. You'll never be the same again. Another aspect with which I would like to close this brief meditation. Another aspect of the other side of worship. First Peter, fourth chapter. You know, Peter was very closely watching what was happening to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he denied Christ, he had observed lots of things and he has given us all those details. It's a summary in his epistle. Look at 1 Peter 4th chapter. Reading from 12th words. Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are approached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. When you accept injustice, 
No, I am only fighting for my rights. I am not asking what does not belong to me, what is not due to me. I am only fighting for my rights. Sorry sir, you are not a Christian. The Bible says justice was taken away from him. No fair trial was ever meted out to the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not open up his mouth. He could have easily argued out his case. He kept quiet. Because he knew the battle was not his. The battle was his father's. How many times your Bible says, brothers and sisters, the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. Then why do you fight? Which Christ are you following? Which cross are you wearing? Leave alone bearing. Which cross is that? The cross alone doesn't mean anything. Maybe it is the cross on which the thief was killed. Crucified. Which cross is your cross? When we talk about worship, we must keep our hearts and minds open for any form of injustice that is done to us. Because that is worship. Every word that is spoken against you will become worship unto him. And every stone that is pelted against you will become a song unto him. Cross is central to all of our worship practices and disciplines and exercises. That is why we will not glory in anything but the cross of Christ. Shall we pray? Eyes closed and heads bowed down. If possible, will you all please stand up in the presence of God? Just stand up in the presence of God with all reverence and the spirit of submission. He did not ask questions. He obeyed God like a child. No wonder he was graduated to be called not only the friend of God but the father of all those who believe. Whose children we are, beloved. Nothing but the cross. I will glory in nothing but the cross. I will reconcile with people whom I have wronged. I won't hold grudge or bitterness against anyone. All bitterness, before it takes deep roots in my life, I would like to plug it away and I would use this season, this week, an opportunity, a God-given opportunity for it. So that my worship becomes acceptable before a holy God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your blessed presence that has been in our midst because we have gathered in the name of your dear Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you Lord that you have called us to worship you. And thank you for the model that you have given us. Even in your very Son, Christ Jesus, who in worship, in eternal worship, offered up himself as a sweet smelling aroma unto you, over which, O oh God, you were satisfied, and you have accepted us in that beloved person. Help us, O oh God, to follow those footsteps, and don't learn things from the world, but get stuck with your word. So we may be true worshippers whom you are seeking, Worshipping in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.